Frank, it is a pleasure to see you again. Thank you so much for coming yeah, by. Thanks, man. It's great to be here again. It was like two and a half years ago. I came to your house for that interview. Yeah. That was so cool. Thank you. Thank for that invitation. That was oh, awesome. You're welcome, man. Oh, well, that's what we were just talking about. A different house now. So when you have to come by again, I'll change it up a little bit. Well, but this is nice. Congrats on the new house. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, one of a few people actually bought a house recently. <laughs> I mean, it's, me too. And you're even more rare than yeah. I am. You bought a house in California. Yeah, it's uh, very difficult to do. <laughs> And you got a half basketball court? Like, you're, you're living large here. Yeah, well, I mean, we, I've done okay in life and stuff. So, like, <laughs> we, we, the kids, the wife was like, you know, I want to get them a basketball court. And I, I was excited because we have a bunch of mats, we don't, and I want to build a gym back there, but we haven't built the gym yet. So the basketball courts, I'm like, oh, look, a nice flat area to put mats on and, and use this for appropriate sport. <laughs> it's funny, when most people talk about building a gym, they're talking about building, like, with weights and stuff. You might be talking about, like, mats to roll around. Yeah, mats and bags. And I will have a limited amount of weights there, but uh, you know, for the most part, when I lift weights, it's kind of my, uh, I don't really go to the bar. You know what I mean? Like my weightlifting time is actually my uh, social time. You know I, mean? I go and hang out, you know, the, the general manager of uh, Lifetime is actually a good friend of mine. He's at my house all the time, you know, uh, Steve and, and his son, Sean. And so like, you know, like I go to the gym, I hang out. So I'll have weights there for times it's inconvenient to get to the gym if I'm traveling yeah. and whatnot. But it'll be a you know, skeleton type system. I'm not gonna, you know, some people try to build this beautiful, you know, facility. It's like, eh. But you're all by yourself. You know I mean, <laughs> would you say that your workouts are similar to they to how they were like 20 years ago, or way different now? Oh, uh, more specific, way different. I mean, I think before I wasted a lot of time, you know, training like a uh, a strength athlete when I was lifting weights and then trying to be a marathoner when I was doing cardio, or you know, you know. Now I realize it's kind of. The way I try to explain to everybody is as a mixed martial artist, I'm a decathlete. You know what I mean? That's what we are, essentially. And so a decathlete can't sit there and go, well, I need to make sure that I put on 10 pounds so I can throw farther. It's like, well, yeah, you can throw the implements farther, but now you're going to screw up your time on, the, uh, uh, on your 1500. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, when you take from one area, you give to another. So there's a lot trying to be very specific and realizing that it's really the basics of everything. It's not real complicated. If people can come and watch me lift weights and hang out with me, they'll be like, this is it. I'm all, well, well, yeah, but I mean, we have to spar today and we're going to roll. And you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's so much to do that if, if, if you go ahead and you have a two hour workout, I'm like, well, that's great. But are you doing strong man? Are you a bodybuilder? Like, yeah. you know, like, let's be, uh, let's be, uh, you know, what are our goals here? You know what I mean? I mean, you can go and I want to get stronger. I'm like, all right, well, I mean, does that mean that you want to be overall stronger or do you want to just be able to hit a certain number on the bench press or deadlift or squat? Or are you trying to like accelerate the bar faster? Do you want to yeah. jump higher? I mean, all those different questions, you know, lead to different types of workouts. UFC fighters are built so differently now. Like, they were built like Frank Baroni or Kevin Randleman back yeah, in Phil, the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or Phil Baroni. Jeez. Frank Mir, you know what I'm saying. That's all right. I got it. Yeah, but they were built like that. They were built like almost like mini bodybuilders. Well, yeah, because at the time, that was kind of where our fitness was, if you walked in. A lot of my workouts probably looked more like a bodybuilder workout. And then for many years, uh, training with Nick Best, I learned a lot about strength training. And then, uh, and it got really into like powerlifting and the strongman competitor uh, type of workouts. And, and I probably look more like that now, except for I just don't lift as intense. And, uh, you know, uh, I just realized that like, you know, the nervous system can only handle so much. I don't care how great of a multivitamins you're on. You can only train so hard. The body can, you know, can only get so many hours of sleep. And so uh, to recover. And so, you know, maybe once every two or three weeks, I'll lift heavy on something. The rest of the time, I go pretty light, you know, and I just, you know, I try to do form and mobility and function, and, and there's a lot, you know, some of the times I do workouts where I'm like, all right, today's a 50 rep day, and people are like, 50 reps? I'm like, yeah, two sets, 50 reps, you're not going to be able to lift that heavy, but it's just going to be, you know, you're going to do a blood pump and, and, and just, you know, help the body heal, and, and there's other days where I'm like, all right, we're lifting, you know, you know, three to five reps, you know, so like, let's warm up, you know. And, uh, you know, we're going to try to see what the max we can do. And, and those are farther and few mm. between just because they wreck the nervous system so bad. People, are, I think, are so used to that old school idea of you need to be in the gym for 60 minutes. It's 10, yeah. 10 reps of everything, three sets of everything, and then kind of move on from there. But it feels like it's evolved so much. Oh, completely. Yeah, no, my workouts are much uh, shorter now. And, uh, you know, it's funny before, you know, I'd sit there and go, man, I would do like, you know, you do chests, all right? So I'm bench press, incline, flies. I'm like... You know, three to four sets each. I'm like, 12 sets for just one muscle group, your chest, huh? It seems like a lot. And then guys will go and do like, all right, I'm going to do rows. I'm like, so you have all those muscles in your back, but you're, you know, and your, your pec is major, pec major, pec minor, but it still has only one insertion, right? You know, and so it's like the balance. And so uh, my back workouts probably look a little bit more intensive and take me 90 minutes just because there's so many 
movements that when you pull and the way the shoulder is for shoulder health, so much about the, 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 the pulling aspect of us. My pushing workouts as far as, you know, and I do a push-pull legs type of format. They're very short, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, I mean, there's only so many ways you can push the bar forward or up, you know? Sure. Push it down, you know, or push it out, you know? So uh, the, the, to gain strength there, it's much easier. You know, I, I see guys, you know, they'll do a, a chest, you know, a push workout. And all of a sudden they're doing shoulder raises, you know, front raise. I'm like, man, your front deltoids are fried. You know, you did, you did, you know, bench, you did incline, you did military press. I mean, you don't think your front deltoid was activated the whole time, you know? And now you're doing a whole separate set just for that. So I think a lot of people overtrain the pushing side, and you can see it in the way their builds are. Their, their shoulders are rotated forward, pulling the humerus, you know, into the, into the shoulder capsule, you know, forward. And, and, and I think the, a lot of shoulder health, which I, you know, was a victim of. That's why I actually specialize so much on it now. This fa- sounds like the whole idea of like, if I knew now, oh, what well, I knew then, how much oh. of a better fighter would you be? Oh, I'd be undefeated. No, with my talent, <laughs> my abilities, and my mindset, had I been my own coach and broke things down the way I break things down to my daughter, no. I mean, because even now, when I'm not injured, I'm sparring in the gym, I still don't really have much of a problem with anybody. Uh, and But that's because of my skill set. And I'm not the athlete I was. I'm injured now, you know, much more injuries and hurt and pain. And uh, if I can do what I do now with the car that I have now, the body, I couldn't imagine what I could do 15 years ago with my skill set, my mindset. Just because, I mean, really, like, even when it comes to throwing a punch, I watch guys and, and, and just no one knows – very few people understand that concept to the level that I do. And then you add in, okay, I also know the grappling aspect and the distance and the kicking, the knees, the elbows, you know, and then the physical conditioning aspects, you know, there's just really when it comes to MMA, I haven't sat down with anybody in a long time that's made me go, oh, shit, you actually are my equal, let alone my superior in the knowledge of the sport. So if we look back at the course of your career and all of the fights, what was the one fight where we can look at it and go, oh, that's where he really started putting it together? You know what? Uh, the Czech Congo fight was pretty much an understanding of, of of going from striking to submissions to striking, going back and forth. And you can see in that fight how quickly I was able to transition from thinking about hitting somebody to choking them. Uh, before that, I trained a lot of individuals. You know, I did what most fighters did back then. I mean, you know, famous you know interview Tito Ortiz gave where I trained you know an hour and a half of boxing, an hour and a half of Thai, an hour and a half of wrestling, an hour and a half of weight training, and that was very much the mainstay of our our, our training back then was okay, I'm going to work with a boxing coach. I'm going to do boxing. And if you sparred that day, you sparred boxing or kickboxing or on your feet, you know. And then even towards the end of my career, we got to the point to where, you know, uh, I would go to the gyms and, you know, and they would train stand-up with takedowns. But the minute you took someone down, they, they stand back up. It was rare, and, and, and now more recently, like, you know, at Syndicate when I'm coaching, Tuesday the pro class, right, I'm the coach. Uh, John's in Singapore, so he usually takes the head roll, and I, and, and I took over for Tuesday. And so uh, – we spar five five-minute rounds with MMA. So we have MMA gloves, but we wear the eight-ounce puffies, we call them. So they're twice the size of a regular MMA glove, a little bit more padding on the knuckles. So for sparring, some guys choose to wear headgear. I'm a, I think you should because of the cutting, uh, not because of concussions, but just, you know, you get more scar tissue. So I make my daughter wear headgear. And so uh, shin guards, knee pads, and, uh, you know, mouthpiece. And so that way, does it make rolling hard? Yeah, it's not easy to roll with shin guards on, but – we still do it. And so I make them go full gambit. And then also on top of that, only the first and last round do I don't interfere. Rounds two through four, I actually will go ahead and say, okay, for example, Tuesday, I had everybody start off, not neutral, but on the back. Mm-hmm. So I, we're going to spar, but you're going to start off with me in the seatbelt position, hooks in, and go. And wherever it goes from there, it's fine. If you can get away really quick or if you can't, uh, we're going to go there in the two-and-a-half-minute mark, regardless of what occurred. You know, if you reverse position, don't reverse position, I call out switch. And so everybody knows wherever you're at, stop what you're doing, go back. So essentially it's almost like there's two rounds within one round. And now if I was on your back, you're on my back now. Now we have to start from there. And that gives people more uh, exposure and more reps to being in those positions. Before, we didn't get a lot of exposure or reps. I used to always say that, uh, you know, MMA was the craziest sport because it was the only sport that you only really did the night of the fight. You know, and that's not really the same anymore. But yeah. back in the day – especially during the peak of my career, you know, I never sparred MMA. I sparred kickboxing with takedowns, and then I would roll jiu-jitsu with some striking. You know what I, mean? like, yeah. I never did MMA rounds until the fight you know, and put it together. So that's why I think you, know, that's why you see the evolution of the sport increasing so much more is that guys are actually and girls are sparring MMA. So with the knowledge that you have, and you're bestowing all of this on Bella, she, she's going to be unstoppable. Yeah, no. She no is way. unstoppable. I mean, I mean, obviously there's nothing 100% in life, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, death and taxes, right? But uh, uh, 
I would put Bella being an undefeated champion is probably number three. <laughs> <laughs> How long to you, till she's in the UFC, do you think? Um, if she wanted to be there right now, she could have been already back in July. Uh, but we held off because she was 17 at the time. And uh, she had two pro fights. Uh, and I, I just want to take our time. And, and right now, she probably would jump into it now. But, uh, but I want her, she wants to follow a college career. She's a national champion in wrestling. Uh, she's an All-American, you know, four or five times over. Uh, you know, multiple times, you know, four or five. She could have been a five-time state champion because she won in eighth grade, but COVID took her one of the years away from everybody. And so um, uh, she wants to really pursue wrestling in the Olympics one year. Oh, you know? wow. So she's, she's taking on freestyle now because uh, I didn't have her – actually, girls in college wrestling, you know, you know, they only wrestle freestyle. So they only wrestle folk style, which the guys in college can it's do. not Greco-Roman. Right. Right. Uh, uh, so – they don't do folk style in college like they do on the high school level for the girls. Oh. Now, guys, once we go to college, U.S. colleges still do folk style. If you're, you know, a U.S. national, you know, if you're an NCAA, NCAA national champion, it's in folk style. Uh, and then you can, for freestyle, is international competition, which you can do also, obviously. And then that's what we compete in the Olympics and international Pan Ams, all that. So I don't have Bella and I don't have my sons train in freestyle. I feel that folk style is much more effective for a base in MMA because there's the element of control. In freestyle, they have takedowns, but, uh, but they do so much parterre and different movements on the ground that have no carryover you know, to, uh, to fighting. I, it isn't like I can sit there and go, like, if you know how to like, work the referee position you know, in wrestling, I can use that in the fight. I'm like, okay, you, you stand-ups yeah. and grambies and all that, you know, sit-outs, those are all things we're going to use when we fight. And controlling a person who's trying to get up to their feet from their knees is an essential skill in MMA. You know, like, hey, you take someone down, and they, they go to their hands and knees, they're coming up, you better know how to break them down and flatten them back out again. That's freestyle. I mean, excuse me, that's folk style wrestling. Freestyle, they don't care about that. They, pair, they, you know, they belly down, they go to the parterre position, and, the, and so I didn't push it. So she's only been wrestling freestyle now for a little over a year. She's uh, competed only, in th she competed at the World Team Trials. I think she got fourth the first year out, and I think the sixth this last year, uh, but both times she lost, she loses in the parterre position. She, no one takes her down, you know. And so she, or I think she got taken down once the whole tournament. And uh, everybody else she takes down, but then the parterre position, both times she lost, she just got rolled, you know, back exposure with her ankles, you know, ankle laces. And, and the one I'd never seen before because I don't really follow freestyle. Once they hit the ground, I could care less too because it just, again, it has no – no fight value to me. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it'd be the same as like, hey, how much do you know about Barambolo and Jiu-Jitsu? I'm like, zero. I couldn't even show you how to begin to show you. Like, I watched it one time, and it was like, my brain goes, boop, I can't use it. It's useless, you know? She's such an interesting case of, is it nature or nurture? Like Both. It, yeah? Is Both. she this good because her last name is Mir? Well, I mean, that genetically, you know, she's uh, you know, a freak. Uh, so, you know, she's stronger and faster than everybody that she, she faces. Uh, she did. The, she trains at the PI, and she did the fitness test. Uh, and she is the most explosive, strongest female under contract in the UFC. There's not a woman in the UFC who's stronger than her. Wow. At, at so 17 years she's of age, under contract. Well, no, Dana oh. lets her train oh, at the PI. You know, and Forrest so. set it up. So she does all her rehab there and training. And she trains at the PI. So we, I mean, we have that relationship. So she's able to go there and train us. So when they tested her, yeah, she the only thing she lost out onto, and she's still there, but she wasn't the number one. You know, obviously, in, uh, was in conditioning. There's other girls that are pretty well conditioned, so she was competitive there, but nowhere near. I mean, when it came to the, the power output, she's the number one. I mean, it just tells you. I mean, here she's on my training program, and, and you know, 17 years of age, jumps in and does the PI. Or she might have already turned 18 at the moment. Maybe she was already 18, but yeah. she was. You know, uh, you know, if if she was in a contract with the UFC, she was the strongest fighter. Physically, most explosive. They do this bar test where they push a bar, how fast they can push it with weighted, you know, it's basically a landmine type with the, uh, with the straight bar. And yeah, she's the most explosive. So no girl hits harder, can pick someone up, lift more weight, run with yeah. it. With with the career that you've had and the pedigree that you have, how much pressure do you think there is on her to try to live up to that? Uh, I wish that was the only pressure that was I was worried about. It's pressure she puts on herself that bugs me. Mm. I have to sometimes really rein her in and check out, be like, hey, you know, like. It was, I think, uh, this just last year she got second at nationals. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there's things that I don't understand about female athletes that sometimes, you know, because I mean, I'm not a woman. So, I mean, there's certain aspects of uh, that happen monthly that, you know what I mean, that, that <laughs> I need to learn more about. And so I am, nutrition-wise, and trying to figure that out. So uh, we didn't understand that. Uh, and so both times that she didn't compete successfully was during that time. 
And we didn't realize why she was so drained. We thought it was a bad weight cut, you know, like, well, like I don't know why. Like, we were basically having to, like, you know, drag her out of the, the, the bedroom, you know, to get her off the, off the bed. It's like, well, what's going on with you right now? And later on, we found out that was the case. It's like, oh, well, you know, her iron has just plummeted. We've done blood work, and now we understand how to fix it. But uh, <clears throat> she ended up getting second place at nationals. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and it was distraught. Like, you know, it was just the end of the world. You know, my wife was like, I'm like, hey, guys, you let's chill for a sec. You know what I mean? Like, I know, you know, like, you know, first place is great, but I mean, like, you just got second best wrestler in the country this year. You know what I mean, like you yeah. lost to one girl. Like, I mean, like, I mean, let's just, you know what I mean? And you're not a full-time collegiate high. You know what I mean? This isn't your, I mean, I guarantee everybody else you wrestled. That's all they do. Mm-hmm. My daughter wrestles. Then she does kickboxing and striking with me. And then we do jujitsu. You know, she's doing, you know, nogi grappling classes at night with, at Drysdale and, you know, and then training. And it's like, she has four or five different disciplines that she's focusing on. I'm like, so, I mean, like, like this is the big picture is for you to be very good at this to help us out for MMA. You know, it's not for us. Let's, I don't want us to lose sight and go, okay, let's not train, you know, our submissions anymore. Let's not train our stand-up so we can be the best at wrestling. If that's what we want to do, we can do it. But at the same time, we can't be frustrated that, you know, if you're a part-time wrestler, getting second in the nation and, and having a first place also under your belt that's not the worst thing. You know? I mean, so sometimes like that pressure, yeah. she really, it was like, I'm like, Hey, you know, like, let's look at this. You know what I mean? I, I love that you're driven, but like, that's awesome. But I mean, you know, you spend 40% of your day being a wrestler and you're out here in the finals, you know what I mean? And winning them. You know what I mean? Like all these other girls are spending a hundred percent of their day. You know what I mean? That'd be like me right now with the amount of kickboxing she does entering into a K one tournament and she's in the finals. It's like, yeah. wow, you only really spend about 20% of your time doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like 40, 40, 20. You know, 40% wrestling, 40% submissions, and 20% striking. You know, like, you know. And she's only 18. Yeah. Like, she's going to be unstoppable in her 20s. Yeah. It's going to be pretty crazy. Yeah. So, and and she has a lot of things also, too. We'll talk about the nurture versus nature. I, I don't make any bones about my own weaknesses that, that sometimes come with being a talented athlete. And, you know, look, uh, I land on my feet no matter what. My, <laughs> my whole life I've been that guy. You know, I can show up almost anywhere and I'll fake it till I make it. You know, my intellect and whatnot, my ability to stay calm has helped me out. But it also is a curse because then it's like, hey, man, don't you, aren't you supposed to prepare for this? Nah, I got this. You know what I mean? Like, it drives my wife nuts. But the problem is, is that, that uh, I'm still successful that way, you know? And so I told my daughter, it's like, hey, like, if I could change something about me, that's what I would change. Let's not be this person. So all my deficits and my, uh, my fallacies and my shortcomings, I make sure she sees them. And I don't try to sugarcoat it like, no, no. Just because I'm successful doesn't mean this is still not a problem. It's like yeah. a guy who's lean who eats like, eh, you know, let's not fool it. You're genetically gifted. You're not good at dieting. You, you do okay at it, but the rest is genetics. Yeah. So let's, let's acknowledge that so that people don't sit there and go, well, I'll just do what you do. I'm like, eh, it might not work that way for you. You know what I mean? So she, uh, she, she is extremely disciplined. In fact, one, thing that, one of the things I'm probably most proud of her of is that in uh, you know, her whole scholastic career so far, uh, you know, you know, from kindergarten to graduating high school this year right now, um, she never missed an assignment. Never had not one missing assignment. And, you know, I mean, she's near a straight-A student. I think she graduated like a 3.86 or something like that, right? And, but, uh, uh, but what's more impressive than that being a straight-A student is, is the not, not missing an assignment. I'm like, yeah. that's impressive. That's, what's, that's, gonna, that's my weakness that, yeah. that now you've now overcome is you don't you 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 sign all you know you cross all the other uh, T's and dot the I's. Yeah. That attention to detail and that just and that's just discipline. It's not hard. It's just are you going to do this monotonous, boring thing day in and day out and not make that mistake of not doing it? And uh, you know I'm not that guy. You know I don't you know make the bed first thing in the morning. You know unless someone's coming over. You know like I don't see the you know but I see the I, I see that and I point out to her. So her discipline is is is, is on a different level. So your lack of attention to detail, it, would you, that's yeah. your weakness? Oh, absolutely. Would, it, would that have been what happened in this boxing fight that you just had? Oh, no. The boxing fight is uh, – I'm sure you can see there, there's a major difference between my right arm and my left arm. And I just now got to the point where I was willing to wear a T-shirt because it's actually twice the size as it was. Uh, about two weeks before the fight – well, back in August, I was training with Nick, and my goal was to bench press over 400 pounds again. I'm like, ah, you know, it'd be nice, you know – you know, I'm in my 40s. You know, I'll pull back on some of this. I'm going to go ahead. And I would like to finally break 700 on a squat or deadlift and break. You know, I've been in the 400s before, but I'm not there. I wasn't there currently. So uh, I hit like 385 in August, and uh, I was feeling pretty good. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, by yeah. October, I should be over 400 again. Yeah. 
the, the next week, uh, the following Monday, you know, uh, when it came back to it, it was 14 days later, I had another, another max out day. And I went to, and I struggled like 365, cut me in half. Like I just couldn't, you know, unracked it, it just fell on my chest. I was like, wow, that, that felt weird. Like, I mean, huh, all right, you know, I spar, I wrestle, you know, I'm, I'm a little overtrained maybe, you know, I'm in the nervous system shot. But my leg workout, my back workout was strong. But my mm. back, I focus so much on it right now, is, is exceptionally strong in the gym when it comes to rowing. You know, I'm one of the stronger guys. Bench press, not so much. And so uh, I just wrote it off that, like, my levers where my tender insertions are, you know, it just, you know, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, by the time uh, the beginning of October hit, Cage, my son, and all of us, Ronan, Bella, we all work out together. And Cage right now, he already bench pressed 315 before the start of his freshman year of high school. And that wow. was that summer right there because he just – this was his freshman year. And so he has two and a quarter on the bench, and he benches it ten times. He racks it. So I get under it, and I go to do it. I get to about rep four, and I rack it, realizing that if I drop for a fifth rep, it's not coming off my chest, you know? And I, like, I set up. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, my strength level is just, just, just plummeting. Like, what the hell? I got scared. I actually went to the doctors because I thought, you know, I made the mistake of going on uh, the Internet. And uh, I'm like, I got MS. I got my, like, it, like, look, shit, first sign, stages. I'm like trying to think about my balance off, you know what I mean? And sure enough, I'd close my eyes in the shower, and I'd get a little dizzy. I'm like, that's not normal. Like, I do a lot of closed eyes drills for balance and stuff. I'm like, man. So I go in, and they do an X-ray. And the first MRI is just of my brain. But they were able to do low enough that they actually caught the neck. And so they made me go in for a neck MRI, to be more specific. They found out that basically my neck was fusing together. I'd lost so much cartilage between vertebrae four, five, six, uh, that my, I was bone on bone. And because of that, it was pinching the nerves off to my arm. And so uh, I needed to have my neck fused. <clears throat> and, but so I, I was like, all right, you know, shit sucks. You know, they told me that, like, you know, uh, I could still have a career, still train, still fight. But, you know, just, you know, people even do disc replacements and still have a career in fight. Look at, you know, the Sterling. Mm. Uh, uh, and so um, then I got a call from my manager about taking the boxing fight with Pulev. And I was like, oh, well, fuck, you know, I'm injured. I, I almost said something. I was like, well, how much? And then they told me it was, it was about a million dollars. I was like, yeah, I'll take it. You know, and so then my wife was like, you know, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, you know, it's not that bad because I, you know, I could still, you know, it's boxing, grappling technique. It's not, you know, you know, uh, We'll see, you know, but then like every workout, it got detrimentally worse and worse. By the time the week of the fight came, uh, I couldn't lift a towel up. Like I was brushing, doing everything with my left hand, my right hand. I, I probably could curl a bath towel about four times before I couldn't curl it anymore. In fact, during the standoffs on the, one of the first days, he went to shake my hand. He pulled. And, you know, of course, it's my right hand to shake hands. And like I had no ability to pull my arm back that it, I was like, fuck, he's going to know, you know, like, you know, that my arm is shot. And so the next day when we had a face off, I turned away and walked off and everybody's like, oh, you know, like showmanship, like, well, no, I just don't want him to feel how weak my arm is. He can drag me all over the stage. I can't fight back. I couldn't out crow my, uh, you know, my, uh, my 12 year old now, uh, you know, even picking a phone up to my face, I couldn't do it. So what I did would to compensate in the fight was I switched to fight purely right handed. It was like, oh, I'll just put my left side forward. It'll be all right. Not knowing and not thinking it's like, well, you know, the way I block a left hook is I cover my ear. And, uh, you know, I probably should have trained some different tactics. And, and I did and tried to do some rolls, but my natural instinct took over. So every time I left hook cub, I wanted to lift my arm and it didn't lift. Oh. So I just kept, so I, I took a lot of bad shots and it actually made the neck injury much worse. When I went to the hospital afterwards, they almost didn't let me leave because I actually, I guess I fractured C6 because again, with no cartilage, there was no movement. So when I got hit, it actually caused a fracture through it. So I <laughs> broke my neck. And so uh, they were like, you know, if you get turbulence or, you know, you, you know, anything, you know, you get rear-ended on the way home right now, you know, you'll be paralyzed. You'll be done. I mean, you could have been paralyzed in the fight. So, uh, so th that was more or less what I was dealing with that. So uh, about the following Tuesday, I, I seen uh, uh, the surgeon, and um, now we're back. And so, Do you yeah. remember anything from that fight? Oh, you yeah. Were, you were knocked out on your feet. No, yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, it's foggy, but, yeah, I was still, you know, until, you know, the call is so interesting to me. Like, I think that the announcer is saying what we were all thinking. Like, what's Morgliata doing? Like, you look like you were knocked out, and the fight just kept going. Yeah, no, I took some hard shots. I just didn't want to go to my butt, you know. I was sitting there like, all right, kind of like a, a moral, you know, victory. I was like, I'm just not going to, you know, I'm not going down. You know what I mean? Like, you know, which in hindsight, taking the fight with the injury, I probably should have just, you know, after, you know, hey, give it your good college try, go out there, and, and if it's not looking good, you know, just, you know. I don't think I'd have lost anything just taking a knee on one of those shots. You were basically a one-armed fighter in that fight. Yeah. Did you think you had any chance of winning it? Yeah, that's the ego still. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah, I was like, well, still, you can catch and land a shot. You know what I mean? 
And yeah. uh, puncher's you know, chance, right? Puncher's chance, yeah. If I could just land one and just get the fight going that direction, but but still, you know, you know, uh, I wanted to go out there. I had my kids even corner me for to show them that like life doesn't always just line up for you, you know, and. Uh, and just because I didn't go out there, and the reason why I didn't take a knee just off of one shot, because I think that looks cowardly. Like, hey, you took the fight injured. You honestly didn't think you could win. And if I said, well, no, I knew I couldn't win. I just went out there for a paycheck. I think that's, you know, almost criminal. But my point was like, well, no, I still felt like there was a chance. I could have pulled it off, and, and I'm going to try to find a way, even though if the odds are stacked against me, which is life. You know, there's times you look at a situation, it's like, hey, man, the odds are not in your favor. It doesn't mean you quit. You know, it's like, all right, well, odds are not in my favor. Guys have succeeded uh, – with worse odds, you know? Yeah, and people not knowing the full circumstances around this thought, like, because you weren't blocking that you just threw the fight. That's what people thought. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't really yeah. Well, I mean, and I guess it makes sense if you can't raise your right arm to do anything. Yeah, no, I wasn't trying to prove us anything by taking shots from Pulev. He hits pretty hard, <laughs> uh, obviously. Uh, no, I just, yeah, like, uh, the signal to my brain, like, when people were asking me, you know, well, what was it like? I'm like, oh, it, it got to the point where actually the pain went away because all the nerves were so compressed. But, uh, uh, but it was like when you said to move your arm, I was like, it'd be like me telling you to move the microphone. Like, okay, move it. You're like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, look right. at the microphone and make it move. I'm like, it ain't moving. You know what I mean? When I, in fact, when I first came back, the first month, man, this injury has been taking forever to heal, uh, to regain my strength. Even right now, I only curl 10 pounds in my right arm. You know what I mean? When I first started off, I worked out with my hand. I had my trainer, Sean, would sit there and, I would lift my, he would help me lift my hand up and then I would fight it on the way down and then lift my hand up and I would fight it on the way down. Like I couldn't hold my hand up. That's how much. It's the, atrophied a lot. Oh yeah. No. And this actually now yeah. if is I'm willing to go yeah. ahead and, and wear a t-shirt now because this is way better than it was before. Before it was, it, I had a 12 inch arm, you know, at least now it's like back to like 15. You know? I mean, your right arm is still bigger than most people's arms. But so. It was funny. My son brought that up. He's all, you know, it's, it's funny because it, when it was really bad, we were looking, he goes, your arm's still bigger than most people, but on you, it looks funny, you know, because, you know, if you know, I walk around the house with no shirt on, it was really obvious, you know, and so, uh, yeah, that was kind of the joke, you know, the one arm. Uh, <laughs> What's going on with your leg? Because you were like limping in here. Oh, I just, I started feeling good. The arm's healed enough to where I can train enough uh, about six weeks ago, and I started rolling around, and, and something popped in my hip, so I got to go get it checked out. So that's causing. Jeez. Yeah. So now it's to the point of like, what's the least injured thing on you? Yeah, pretty much. When I go there, it's funny. Uh, you know, when you go to the doctor, they tell you to list all your surgeries or list your injuries. I was like, hey, man, I can tell you what doesn't hurt you know, more than I can tell you what hurts. Like, my left wrist is good. Never had a problem with it. You know I mean? But every other joint on my body is screwed up, messed up on some degree of recovering or on its way to a major injury. So when you go to BioAccelerator and get stem cell, like, are they just putting this everywhere in you? Yeah, know? I did my knees last time, my shoulders which helped out drastically because on my left arm, I had torn my labrum and I opted not to get the surgery and it was so painful. And then until I did the stem cell through them about four to six weeks later, my left arm is fine now. In fact, I, it's probably, I haven't had an MRI of it. I'm sure it's still torn, but uh, the range of motion and my ability to train now, you know, it's light night and day. So it, it helped out majorly with my knees because uh, I had stopped squatting and lifting there. And that's actually why I was back to thinking that, oh, let me try for 700 because the, you know, training with Nick, who also went down to a bioaccelerator, I felt so great afterwards that I'm like, oh, it rejuvenated my ability to want to go ahead and start, you know, I can lift a little heavy again and, and start doing these. So my body was less broken, you know, and things yeah. are less painful. It's, it's, it's easier to stay motivated in the gym um, when you're not, you know, screaming, you know, at night in bed, <laughs> you know. And so, um, but, but now it's been too long since I went there, honestly. Uh, you know, uh, we went in 2019 and then, um, you know, 2020 and, and 21 got screwed up. Well, 20 got screwed up because of COVID, and then it got pushed back. And then I was supposed to go back out in November because I didn't know when I first talked to him in August. It's like, oh, you know, let me add the neck. There's something wrong with my neck. It was just hurting. I didn't realize of what was going on in there. And so uh, I just thought I had, you know, neck pain, you know. And so, <laughs> and so they were going to, you know, try to inject my neck and then do my knees, shoulders, and, and, and hips again. And, uh, and so I'm going back again in July with Bella because she has, you know, already starting to get injured. So trying to stay ahead of the curve on her. And then, uh, and then this time I'm actually going to have them, even though that my neck now is fused from four, from C4 to C7, uh, they, uh, uh, uh and yeah, if you're ever in Vegas, you need a good surgeon. Kaplan's phenomenal. Like, I mean, my neck, I mean, immediately when I woke up, I could move my arm a little bit again, obviously with no strength, but, uh, and the pain went to hundred percent gone. Uh, my neck's not a problem. If, you, if anybody had talked to me before, if you saw me, even when I've done, you know, 
anything on TV, I'm constantly, I was pulling and squeezing on my neck, constantly in discomfort and pain, and that helped relieve it immensely, you know? So with all these surgeries, could you fight again now? You know what, I'm gonna keep, my goal, and that's what's my goal has been probably the last two years, is I just wanna be in the gym and train. I like to be healthy, I like to, you know, especially when I'm coaching people, I wanna be able to demonstrate what I'm talking about, you know, or, and show them, you know, if someone goes, I don't really think that works, I'm like, cool, go grab your mouthpiece, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll show you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, and so, uh, I enjoy martial arts. I enjoy fighting. I enjoy sparring. I enjoy rolling. I enjoy, I like those things. You know, I didn't fight because I thought I was going to become famous. I mean, hell, when I first started fighting, I turned pro in 2001. No one really bragged about being a fighter. You know, like it wasn't mainstream. It was, it was yeah. still like human cockfighting. That's the time. exactly what yeah. people were alluded to. You know, like yeah. it got to a while there that I probably lost more dates than I gained. In fact, actually, my current wife now almost left me when we were through the dating period. When she first saw me, she came out and watched me fight at Pete Williams' fight. And we were just dating at the time. And uh, as soon as the fight's over with, you know, obviously, you know, I'm 21, 22-year-old guy. I get back to my phone. Oh, hey, did you get to see? Because I knew she was in the audience, you know. And she's like, yeah, we got to talk. You know, I got a kid. Like, I just didn't know this side of you. And I'm like, what? what? So she actually was going to leave me because she's wow. like, this is barbaric. I thought you did, like, Thai boxing or something. Or, or, or what'd she say? Billy Blanks. I thought you did, like... Cardio kickboxing. I was like, oh, you don't know what Emily played. Was that Ty Bo? Yeah, Ty yeah. Bo. Yeah, yeah. Because when we first met, you're like, hey, what do you do? I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm a bouncer and I do this and, you know, I, and I train martial arts. I do. I think at the time I even called it no holds barred. You know, like, I do that NHB fighting in the UFC. She had no clue. You know what I mean? Your job while you were in UFC was you were a bouncer at Spearmint Rhino, right? Yeah. Like one of the most famous strip clubs here yeah. in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> you, you probably seen some stuff. I've got to see human nature. I got to see <laughs> money, drugs, and sex, uh, and people surrounded by it at all times. I get to really see human nature. How many arms did you break as a bouncer? Never. You know, well, uh, there might have been one time there was a kid who grabbed me as he was leaving, uh, and he wouldn't let go of my suit. Yeah, his wrist looked pretty jacked by the time we got done with each other. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I center locked him bad. You know, I put his pinky against his elbow. And, uh, and, and so it probably broke. But for the most part, I wouldn't do that to people. I did a lot of walk-alongs and, and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, I would put people in joint manipulation for motivation. But then I started learning early on in my career that it only worked against people that are moderately sober. Because then, like, you know, a drunk guy has a high pain tolerance. And what am I going to do, break your arm? Uh, I'm going to fucking be poor by the time all the lawsuits settle, Right. Uh, I learned that cutting off the blood to someone's brain was the most effective way to, 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 to motivate people to, to see things my way. What was your favorite choke? A uh, rear naked choke. Okay. I have a turnaround. When we're done, I'll show you on camera. It's one of my things I teach in all my self-defense classes. I'm 400 for 400 on it. Like, I've never missed it. You know what I mean? Like, every time I go and someone, we've had a conversation, basically, I hit an arm drag and I take people's back standing and I push their hips out from underneath of them. I, I got it from small circle jujitsu. Watched a video on it one time. I was like, oh, let me train that. Man. Does it, yeah, and it works great because... It won't work in an MMA fight because we're too far from each other. And then even in the clinch, you're, you're fighting somebody who already knows they're in a fight. So, you know, the plum clinch and a lot of over under 50-50 clinches are going to be much more prevalent. Uh, uh, but this one works great because it works phenomenal on somebody who's standing there with their chest against your chest. You know, they're facing your face squared, you know, with their knees uh, aren't bent. Can you show us now if we go to a two shot? Like, don't put it. Well, you guess you don't don't take me out, but. Yeah, you want to see it? I just want to see the technique here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hold on. We'll, we'll, have to probably we'll just have to move take, closer. We have to we'll take our to headgear off. Okay, we'll take our headphones off here. We'll just move our mics over. Yeah, we're we gonna stand. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just pull, pull your mic up a little. All right, so we don't hear them. So okay. I would be here, and people walk up to me. Right? Yeah, they're in your face. Right. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, oh my true. god. So you can see how like wow. you're not ready for it because we're sitting here talking like, hey, buddy. I just push and I cheat because I'm stepping behind you. Yeah. So I turn you half the distance. I turn half the distance. And then I pull you into the choke oh. by pushing your hips out. It's off camera. Wow, yeah, I see it. And then it. now, boop. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I like how you took your, uh, your flip-flops off for that. Yeah, Jeez. just for, for barefoot. <sighs> I felt like I was an inch away from death there. <laughs> wow, that's an impressive, that is. No, it catches people off guard. Like I said, if you resist and you pull back, I've only done that a couple times. I've had guys. Back that way oh, now. sorry. Yeah, I've only had a couple that's guys the, that's the spot. pull on me. Probably have a wrestling background and understand, you know, that I'm taking Ryan, their corner thank on them. You. Wow, coming in here to readjust the cameras, so watch me uh, get choked out here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Last time we talked, you were like you were training to be a pro wrestler. Yeah, I was trying to get into it, but then I kind of realized that. Look, man, I have a lot of respect for guys in the pro wrestling industry. Uh, they have way more injuries, and there is a much more dangerous sport than mine. 
that being said, as far as the, the health of your body, you know what I mean? Look, uh, the mental fortitude to walk out there and fight in front of a bunch of people, look, pro wrestling, do they have that? No, that's not the same, you know, because they're not nervous about outcomes and beating somebody and, and you know, but they're still going out there performing and they got to go out there and get hurt and take dives and, and bumps, you know, that, uh, that they know they're going to do backstage. In fact, you know, you can go to, you know, at least I can go into a fight and hope that I'm not that injured by the time. Yeah, the you could over. come out of a fight unscathed. You could. Yeah, pretty much when you guys, those pro wrestlers are, are, are very scathed. You know? Yeah, you're always bumping. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah, so I trained it for a little bit, and, and, and we got the first part. I, I seemed very motivated at first because, you know, we, they said, oh, we got to learn how to tumble. I'm like, oh, watch this. I can do cartwheels and, and you know, the bumps, the front flip land on your back. I'm like, no problem. You know, from my wrestling and jiu-jitsu background, you know, the dexterity and the agility to roll around, oh, yeah, no, no issues. And even taking bumps, just hitting the, the, uh, the, the, the canvas was fun. I'm like, oh, this is fun, you know what I mean? But then when it started, like, taking shots and getting twisted on and giving up my limbs to open up, you know, it was just too difficult for me. And, I just, and then, you know, watching uh, Austin Aries, you know, just in the gym, he got injured training. You know what I mean? He did some, it was like, a, uh, I think it's one of his signature moves, like a 720. He, like, jumped off the rope where he does a front flip. Oh, 450, and then, yeah. 450. Yeah. And then landed on his face, right? In fact, he's such a good... Like, so impressive to watch because so many times I didn't know what was real or what wasn't. Like, hey, wait a Even then, I had to like about a minute pass. I'm like, hey, uh, is this real now or is this? Did you really? Hear? And sure enough, he ripped the top of his nose, basically the, the the tissue. I don't know what that's called that separates your two nostrils. He ripped it so bad that it basically had one large nostril when he looked oh up because he landed. Oh my gosh! What is it? I don't know. I'm just saying. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! Wow. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Wow. That is. Yeah, so that's why I realized, like, ah, you know what? I've already had a long life of a career that that that, that has not been the, the best to my body. This might not be a second life for me. Speaking of pro wrestling, how close were you to Mir versus Lesnar 3? Uh, you know what? I wanted to put myself in position by, you know, uh, going out there and being successful at it. But, uh, you know, it was one of those things. that it, it wasn't even in the talks yet. But you guys were one and one. Like, what about it happening again in UFC? Oh, I would be game, you know. Like, I mean, maybe not now, but were, were we ever close to it? No. Five, why not? Um, not on his radar. I guess it's just not that he wants to do it. I mean, when you're the A side, you know, he's the draw money-wise. He gets to make more of the calls. And I know? guess he avenged the loss. And I guess Yeah, I think that going good. out there, you know, from what I was told, uh, uh, that that because of the way I responded after the second fight, that uh, he truly felt that I was a little off. You know what I mean? Like, it, I think in Lesnar's mind, like, how could you want to fight me again? Like, you know, people don't, you know, so there's something wrong with you. And I think it kind of made him uneasy. You know what I mean? What's more memorable from UFC 100? Is it him beating you or is it his speech after with the Coors Light and Bud Light and the whole thing there? Uh, I, I like the speech afterwards. I thought that, uh, you know, it was definitely, uh, you know, home to his... Uh, his uh, demographic, you know. I mean, he's not a guy that does a lot of promos. Like in WWE, he barely yeah. talks. For like for WWE fans now to go back and watch that promo, they're like, "Give us this Brock Lesnar." Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know much about his pro wrestling. I don't watch that often, so I don't know how bad he is at it. But uh, but I think that he's definitely a guy. Like from what I understand, listening to other people in the industry, you know, he does the bare minimum of what he has to do to cash a check, and you know, I don't fault him for that. Like. Hey, look, we all got to make uh, money. And, uh, you know, I think he's more naturally a fighter than he is a pro wrestler. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's not his first love, but financially it pays better. And, uh, and, and obviously he can continue to do it for a lot longer. Is he your number one rival? Is he the one person that people talk to you about the most? Or is it someone else? No, no, definitely Lesnar would be the number one I get spoken to about. You know what I mean? And then who is it? Uh, Noguera, you know, just because uh, fans of the sport, more Noguera. Fans that are casual fans of the UFC – you know that you know uh, the, Brock is who they talk to me about. But if but if they're like a hardcore, if they know who Pride, you know, oh they know about Pride, they know Fedor and all that. You know, those times, you know, the, you know when you know the you know uh, uh, Vandalay Silva was you know the, you know the, <laughs> the Axe Man or what was it called? What was Vandalay's nickname? Yeah, well the uh, the Axe Murderer was. Yeah, it? the Axe Murderer. Yeah. So you know they sit there and talk. About, if they're fans that understand what that means, then yeah, then uh, then they talk to me about Noguera. Yeah. Who who do you wish you could have fought? Is it Fedor? Uh, well, no, I faced Fedor in Bellator. Uh, yeah, I guess Fedor in UFC. Yeah. That would have been cool to see him. In yeah, UFC. I wish we could have fought there. Uh, uh, honestly, just a Brock for a third time would still be a goal of mine just because of where I've evolved. And, you know, now it's just, you know, the time is, the clock is ticking on that because, you know, at 43, I've realized that I am mortal and that, you know, that, 
what I, you know, sometimes my mind wants to do things. I'm like, ah, just, it ain't going to happen. So, you know, like my training now is so much different. Even now, you know, like I walk to the gym and, you know, my kids are training. And like, you know, and I, I load up the bar and there's like that. I'm like, eh, guys, like, you know, the, you know, ROI on this. You know what I mean? I can go ahead and lift with you guys what you're lifting. But, uh, you know, I'm going to be hurting tomorrow or tonight when I'm laying in bed. Like, I'm going to be, you know, suffer for it, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, I lift a lot lighter. I do a lot less intensity, you know. You know, when I spar, I'll take rounds off in between. Like, no, nope, I'm good, guys. I'm going to go here or I wrestle. Or even, it's funny, I'll roll with people, and they think I'm being condescending because I'll tap if I'm in an uncomfortable position. You know, just even if, uh, you know, we're in referee, I put my foot up. The other day I did that, and the person pulled me back on my hips, and my foot kind of got stuck under me. I was like, ah, stop, tap. And they're like, well, what is that? I'm like, wow, well, it was kind of sitting on my knee, and my hips messed up, you know, my hip injury I'm dealing with. I'm like, it didn't feel good. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. tap. And, then, you know, and they're so competitive. They're like, well, no, I mean, but would you have tapped in a fight? I'm all, what, what? Like, what do you mean? Like, huh? I'm like, I'm tapping right now. That's the pro- point of this, you know? Yeah. It hurt. I didn't want to get my hip more injured. Yeah. You got me, dude. Like, let's reset. Like, you, yeah. know, like, you know, take a win, man. It's all right. <laughs> do you think you have another match in you? Um, you know what? I'm going to tell you probably in a couple months. Uh, actually, Harris and I were talking about that. Uh, if in July, in, uh, you know, in August, I can go back to sparring again. With, a- after with my, the stem cell? Yeah, I'm going to yeah. take the stem cells, and then after I come back from that, I'm going to look at what my, my body feels like. If I can spar and train and roll normal, then, yeah, I'm going to do another I just feel like you're not a guy who wants, like, you're not, you don't want to retire. No, I I want to keep fighting. There's a lot of guys that as they approach 40, they're like, eh, I think 40 is the number for me. I'm going to retire. No, in fact, even why I pull back and sometimes I give people that look because they see the intensity which I roll or I I spar at or, you know what I mean, or, or, you know, like even right now before my neck, I was only sparring hard once a week. You know, I would spar three times a week, but only one of those sessions would be like, all right, you know, like, we're going to go after it a little bit here, you know. Uh, they would take that as a sign, that, oh, you, you know, you've lost that edge. Like, well, no, it's because I want to fight that I realize that at 42, you know, 41, I, if I spar and I wrestle and I lift and I do everything like a 20-year-old, I'm never going to make it to that cage again. I have to pull back and do things much more intelligently and realize, all right, you know, what am I doing and what is the benefit of that? You know, am I doing it for my ego? Like, you know, if, if all of a sudden I'm in the gym and, a, you know, a 225 rep contest breaks out, I just watch. You know, like, you know what do you mean? I'm, like, I'm not the old me would jump in. You know, yeah. like all right, well, this is the only times I can do it. You know, uh, and be competitive with everybody. And, and now I pull back because the big picture of me wanting to be healthy, roll, train, and still take fights. You know, so I'm like, all right, this sucks. I got to pull back here if I want to have a chance there. There's a real lesson in here of like taming your ego. I feel like oh, big time. It's been uh, definitely an experience. Uh, my midlife crisis. You know. <laughs> Although I feel like with the Jake Pauls and Logan Pauls of the world, there might be another spot for you on a boxing card. Would you be up for that? Yeah, I would just definitely want to because I think I made such a good showing in my first fight, boxing, yeah. you know, with Cunningham that, like, I showed against a world champion boxer who was extremely fast, you know, that I could hold my own. And, uh, you know, and then the second match, you know, for people to sit there and think I threw the fight or whatever happened, it's like, ah, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I, I kind of regret, you know, taking the fight. I go back and forth. I'll say that for five minutes that I regret taking the it fight. bought you a new house. Yeah, no, I did do that, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, but but then, you know, for people to think, you know, well, you know, you don't want it anymore. You did it just for this. Or financially, you were injured. It's like, no, I still wanted to go out there and try to test myself, even if the circumstances were. You know, I mean, like, what do you do if you get out of your car and there's five guys? Your, your family's in the car. You sit there and go, hey, this is unfair. There's five of you. There's only one of me and I, my wife and kids in the car. No, you're going to get out and make it happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or die trying. They're going to find me dead. You know what I mean? But they're going to find someone's testicles in my hands. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like I died, but like, you know, you knew I was here, you know? And so, uh, so you know, that's the mentality. I think that so many people don't have. So I think that's why they think that I'm weird. You know, I'm like, look, man, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe it's growing up with video games. Everybody's used to like, all right, you get a second life or go ahead and hit reset. I'm like, nah, man, sometimes it's not a reset. Your health bar is low. You lost all your equipment. You got to drive forward and go beat the boss, man. Figure it out. That's no. the bouncer in you talking, I feel like. You've seen so much shit, I feel like. <laughs> Maybe. That it's Maybe. like, no, no, I've seen too much. Yeah, well, like I said, like, that's just uh, life, man. Like, life doesn't always line it up for you. It doesn't give you everything you need. You just, and, and sometimes you have to, you know, the old, what they say now, you know, uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. You got to make it happen. And that's yeah. something that I think that we're losing our society is that too many people, because of this whole fucking uh, participation awards, that you get a place, or a medal for just showing up. You know, or I make it safe for the, you know, the 0.03% to feel comfortable about their choices they made in life. That now that they feel that, like, I have to bend to them, it's like, well, no, like, just that's not how it is. Life's unfair. In fact, that's the one word in my house that I hate. You know, I don't necessarily don't cuss. I think I've probably already said a few F words probably today. 
you know, if I'm on air, I try to watch myself. But, I mean, my kids all go to private school. They hear me cuss, and they just know the, the one word that I immediately would stop me for our dinner conversation. It would be like the, 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 the record would come to a halt, right, is if any of my kids ever said, that's not fair. Well, that's the F word for you. That's the F word. Do you ever dare say that to me? You know what I mean? Like, there's no such thing as fair. That's a made-up human word. Like, fair, what the hell does fair mean? Life's not fair. I mean, hell, from the moment we were, you know, conceived, you know, it was a billion and one shot. That's you, you know? I mean, life's just not fair. It's just, it's not even. I, there's nothing I can do to make it even. You know, you know, equal opportunities, and you know, is about all we can uh, pretty much provide anybody with. But as far as equal outcome, no, you can't. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it's not going to work. There's going to be somebody who's a busser. There's going to be somebody who doesn't make it. You know, like, that's just life, man. And what is that? Is that? Do you think that's someone's drive that they don't have the drive to want to be well, more? Oh yeah, because they got more? killed from them. They got taken from them at a young age. I think that's a, a lot of it is our, our scholastics program. You know, especially the education system the last forty years has been pushing that. You know, uh, to, to, to that that like you know, government and, and those you know because you know the school would do it for them, make everything fair, make it even. Like, well, no, let's give everybody. You know, I don't want anybody to feel left out. Well, yeah, feeling left out's a good thing, you know. Sometimes bullying, like this whole anti-bullying all the time, like, well, no, I think obviously bullying to an extreme is horrible, you know what I mean? But anything too extreme is bad. Hell, I can die from drinking too much water, you know what I mean? There was a girl that died from a contest. She gulped a bunch of water to win an Xbox, threw off her electrolytes in her body, and she died, you know what I mean? So too much water can kill you. So, you know, can too much bullying be a bad thing? Yeah, but too little bullying is a bad thing too. I even make jokes sometimes. My wife will see somebody walk by, you know, <clears throat> You know, holes, you know, every part of their face tattooed on their eyelids, just just crazy looking. You know what I mean? I'm like, ah, you know, like <laughs> you know, somebody wasn't bullied enough as a kid. You know what I mean? Like, I'll make that joke. You know what I mean? Like, but that being said, that like sometimes like that's a motivating factor. I remember, look, I think I was in third grade. There was a girl I thought was cute. I, I tried talking to her. Now, for a third grade boy to walk up and talk to a girl, you know, it was already at the end of my uh, my abilities. I, was, I, I dug as deep as I could. <laughs> And then she covered her face, and she goes, oh, my God. My dad had been telling me to brush my teeth every morning and had to fight with me all the time. Son, did you brush your teeth? Son, did you brush your teeth? And I was hit and miss. I always brush my teeth now. I have no problem with dental hygiene since that one moment in third grade because a girl that I liked made fun of me. She told other people that my breath sank, and it was humiliating. It embarrassed me, and it drove me. I didn't sit there and go to the teacher and make it to where her parents said that she couldn't tell me my breath stank. It was like, well, no, your breath stunk, and it caused... I didn't like the feeling that that adversity, that suffering, that humiliation caused me to change for the better. You know, and I think that's something that we need in our society more is that, you know, that's why MMA makes in martial arts and wrestling and boxing, I think makes people of such character. Because if I go out there, and go, hey, man, I, there's this new jab, the way I'm going to have you throw it. Cool. We go out there and you know, at the end of the round, you walk up to me and your nose is sticking out your ear. You're like, hey, uh, I don't know if that's working out so good. I'm like, yeah, I know, but, but it should. I'm like, but it's not. You know what I mean? We get to test out reality real fast. It's not about our emotions, how I feel something should work. Mm. It is how it actually works. And so, uh, you know, uh, that's just the reality of it, you know? What do you think is the biggest life lesson that fighting has taught you? Oh, there's no guarantees. Zero guarantees. So, like, there's no guarantee of failure and there's no guarantee of victory. All we can do is push the needle. And I say that all the time. My wife and daughter is probably tired. My boys, you know, push the needle. Meaning that, like, look, you know, if I eat healthy, I keep my weight manageable, I exercise every day, does it mean I'm going to probably live longer? Well, yeah, there's no guarantee. Hell, the guy that invented jogging died at, like, 45, you know what I mean, of a heart attack. <laughs> Is so, that true? Yeah. The no guy, way. The, the, the person, I, I can't remember his name right now, but made jogging famous, had a heart attack at 45. Yeah. While, now, while smoked, jogging? Uh, who knows? I don't remember that part, the details. But I just remember just sitting there thinking, I'm like, wow, you can do everything right and still fail and and i've seen guys look i you know do everything wrong and be successful now percentage wise though if i sit there and go hey what are the percentages of success if you do everything right well it'll be much higher yeah. so i can make sure i guarantee success by pushing the needle in that favor well can't guarantee success but i can push it more in a successful range and also too i can hurt it i can, if i eat hamburgers and bacon you know four or five times a day and i never exercise i just sit on the couch and i'm 300 pounds overweight probably gonna have a heart attack not a guarantee, but I've definitely pushed the needle in that yeah, way. Yeah. Now, if I stay healthy and eat right, you know, could I not have a heart attack? Well, yeah. You, but again, no guarantees. And I think people want that. They want to sit there and go, well, I, I did this. It just didn't come out for me. Like, well, well that's life, man. Yeah, you do businesses. Yeah. I mean, how many guys I know that are millionaires? It's like, well, hey, your first business, you knocked it out of the park. I've never met one that ever told me yes. Yeah. Usually it's failure after failure. I just went up and did, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> for uh, uh I was up at, uh, in Illinois, 
And I was talking to a rich you know, a guy who was well off, you know, $500 million, you know, guy. And, I mean, back in, I think, 2001, basically, he was like, you know, $8 million in debt. You know, it was the flip side. You know, there's risks. You know what I mean? There's a lot of guys that just, you know, and you got to take a shot. And, again, I think the biggest life lessons that that has shown me and, and that I see, that you get to visually see, is that you can only push the needle. You can do everything right and have more success, but you can't guarantee it. You know, and you can do everything wrong and have less success. But even there, I've watched guys, you know, like out partying, girls, wives, upset with them. You know what I mean? Everything that you can sit there and go, man, there's no way this guy's going to pull this off. Go out there, 15 seconds later, one overhand right, now they won the fight. I'm like, wow, well, shit, you know? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they're not going to do that over a long enough period of time. But yeah. again, so... That's, that's the thing that I think that's really helped me is that, like, in life, I just push the needle. Yeah. I try to, you know, do things just to go ahead and push the needle in my favor. It doesn't mean things are going to be perfect. You know, there's another saying I always have is anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. Mm. You know, there's a lot of workouts that I'll show up and, you know, when I do them, it's like, I'm hurting today. I'm just going to do this. And people watch, like, what the hell was that? I'm like, well, I mean, that's what I could do today. And I turn in a 30 out of 100, you know. But if I didn't show up, I turn in a zero. It doesn't yeah. average out that well. yeah, yeah. I mentioned Jake Paul earlier. I'm so curious to hear your thoughts on him. Is he the real deal? Well, you know what? After his last fight, I have to give him credit. I think that that's a great showing. I mean, I know, look, no matter what, we can critique that he hasn't fought a real boxer his own size. You know, uh, you know even Woodley, who's great boxing skill, I feel. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> there's a drastic size and reach advantage, uh, disadvantage for Woodley in that fight. And um, uh, But I think that the, Paul, I'm actually – in favor of them because I think a lot of people, again, you know, talk about what we do. The, uh, the fights that we just had in Miami, uh, our, re our freedom fight nights that I'm doing again July 15th in Arizona, um, it's all about culture, right? And I'll, I'll wrap this up how it's going to come to talking about the Pauls. Um, right now, our youth admires mostly people with left side uh, mentality, you know, uh, ideals. Well, it makes sense because if you think about Hollywood is owned by the left, our major sports organizations are pretty much all left. Uh, so all our children's heroes that they idolize, you know, they click on and they watch LeBron James, then they're going to admire how he plays basketball and everything else. Well, yeah, they admire him as an athlete. Then, well, that steps into the next level. You start admiring and, and, and wanting to take on their ideals. Like, well, what, is, what, is, what does he think about this? Well, he thinks that that cop shouldn't have shot that girl. I'm like, really? He, he made that statement with no study and no understanding of what was actually going on, and he made a – you know, uh, could have really been detrimental to a human being's life. He just, you know, almost destroyed with his uh, with one tweet. Uh, so that being said, uh, our identity for our youth, we're, our culture war is definitely being lost. And uh, unless our kids, you know, you find a youth that has a military aspirations, their most of their idols are on the left. So I want to, uh, you know, restore freedom. Our fight nights, you know, through Cloud Hub and other social media app that we have that we display them on is a way for us to showcase all these guys that are out there to have the same thought process that I have. And it isn't even so much left, or excuse me, right-minded uh, people, uh, because we have people that fought on the card. They're also uh, liberal in that sense. Uh, but they do believe in the freedom to be able to speak their mind and have conversations. And so, uh, so uh, I want to you know, show children that these athletes are to be admired and give them a free platform on which to speak. So wrapping up why I think that the, you know, the, the, the Paul brothers are actually a good thing is because look how many kids are getting into fighting now. They want yeah. to do martial arts. They want to wrestle, want to box, get into combat sports. Because I think combat sports, bar none, is one of the best things a child can do. If you're a parent and you want to put your kid in something, make them wrestle. Make them do judo, jiu-jitsu, boxing. Put them in those sports because they're going to suffer. It's going to hurt. It's going to build character. It's going to teach them how to rely upon themselves, how to face adversity, how to overcome adversity, how to have self-doubt, how to, you know, all these things they're going to be able to work on in a daily, you know, uh, a daily process with somebody in front of them trying to kick their ass and then someone showing them how to overcome that. Fear, how to deal with that. You know, so much of my success in life and other things I've done have stemmed from my success of my martial arts mind. And so the, the brothers, I think it's great. You know what I mean? Like, do I agree with everything that they say or do and they're saying well no i mean you know uh, there's a 20 year age gap you know what i mean like you know they're, they're, i could be their dad more than anything else so i mean you know uh, but but as far as the eyes that they're bringing like the kid really trains i mean you say what you want about yeah. him he trains hard he trains hard like that's respectable he didn't just show up and go hey i'm so and so and you know he could have had trainers throw in bullshit guys to spar with him like hey man make sure you make him look good 
No, that kid's honestly, there's guys that are sparring with him. I've, you know, I've talked to some of my friends down in Florida that have got in the gym. Like, they're like, no, go get him. You know what I mean? Like, get his ass. They're getting people to buy pay per views that have maybe never watched a boxing yeah. pay per view ever. Turning eyes and getting yeah. attention to our sport, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. I really do. I see it as a much net gain than a, a net loss as far as the mode, you know, for, for our culture. It's not like, you know, you know, it's not like this is the Kardashian show where I'm like, ah, look, man, this is completely just, you know, the decay of our civilization here, guys, just embodied on TV right there. I think that the, uh, you know, Jake and, and I, I, I'm, I'm commendable. I'm glad what they're doing. I think that, uh, you know, it, it's great. I'm all for it. Yeah, Jake and Logan are definitely bringing a lot of eyes to the sport. Yeah, and sure. like I said, they train. They really train. Had they just dialed it in, if they just showed up and go, well, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm this YouTube star. I'm just going to show up, and you're going to buy the pay per view. You know, I mean, look at what what's his name kind of equivalent did uh, 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 Charlie Sheen. You know, when he did a stand up, we're basically like, ha ha, assholes, you bought the ticket, right? <laughs> like yeah. they could have honestly done that. They could have said, hey, you know, like shown up, laid an egg, and just said, screw it. They would have came out with money in their pocket, but they didn't. They they went out there and, and actually lived the life. They're like they actually train yeah. and fight. Like they are yeah. uh, for him to be. He is a boxer. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying he's a YouTube star who boxes. I would say that, you know, Jake and Logan, they're, all, they're legitimate boxers now. To say otherwise would be silly. It'd be like, well, they went out there and they've had fights. They go out there and they train like a boxer. At what point do you not give them the, 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 the description, the adjective? Well, no, they're, they're a boxer, and that's what he is. Yeah, it, it'll be very interesting when they actually fight someone who's the same size with a similar skill level who's also a boxer. Yeah. Maybe I, that's the next fight. No, it has to be, I think, at this point. They, uh, you know, look... I think they were smart how they've matched up every fight up to this point. Yeah. Uh, and I think now, like, yeah, that's what the crowd's screaming. They realize that them fighting somebody who's not a boxer, just another YouTube star or some kind of rapper, uh, that's not going to, you know, no one's going to be impressed. They're like, all right, well, you can kick the shit out of anybody who's not a fighter now. Like, yeah. now you got to fight a fighter. You know what I mean? Yeah. It'd be like me, even now, with my injuries and my age, facing somebody who's a celebrity, go, okay, how many fights does that guy have? Like, none. Like, there's no chance. Yeah. Yeah, very little, right? The needle is almost on the guarantee yeah. of loss for you, buddy. Sorry. You know I, mean? I don't think anybody's going to, you know, buy into that. You know, that there's a – but uh, at this point, yeah, they go fight a boxer. I think we're good. Well, look, Frank, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. I'm Thanks, so glad man. we were able to sit down and do this because it's been way too long. Yeah, man. You got to learn the, my secret choke. Jeez, uh, that was insane. I feel like my life flashed before my eyes with that. Wow. I end every conversation with the same question because I'm all about gratitude. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? Uh, family. You know what I mean? That, uh, my family, my wife, my children have definitely given me direction in life. Uh, Help me you know, stay on the path when I fall off of it. Uh, you know, and then uh, I guess another thing I'm grateful for is for the martial arts. It's given me the mindset how to overcome and you know, gives me my identity and my culture. And that third is I really enjoy the people that dislike me. Because uh, I say that they give me the motivation to achieve. You know, anytime I feel like shit, I'll actually read bad comments about myself. And it gets me out of bed because I want to prove everybody wrong. You know, I, I, it makes me feel good to make them hate me. What's the meanest thing that you've seen that someone said about you? Oh, you know what? I've had people say things about my children before. And, and yeah, that, that one's, that's, that's hard to swallow. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you can say what you want about me. I laugh. And if it's clever, I'll even read it and tell other people about, hey, look at this asshole, man. Look what he said about me. Like, that's pretty good, right? You know, and people get uncomfortable. Like, you find that funny? I'm like, that's oh, fucking hilarious. You know what I mean? Like, that's good. That's well thought out, man. I like that. It's clever. But uh, yeah, once I start reading anything about my daughter or my children, like, yeah, yeah, that, that, some idiot on there. That I guess the, at least I calmed down because I went through their social media and realized that they were just a moron. But they were trying to say that Bella was a transgender, and that and because my son Cage, until he got his hair cut for Gorman, because the Catholic school has long hair, that he's really. Like, that they're both transgender switches or from he was really a girl or I don't know. Mm. I started reading and I got pissed off and then like I went through it like I was going to find them like All right, where do they fucking live? I'm, gonna, I'm going, you know what I mean? Fucking, I have the money to show up, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay for the lawyer. I'll spend 30 days in jail. It'll be fun. <laughs> Let's see how fast you heal. <laughs> uh, but then I went through their stuff and I'm like, oh, this guy's a moron. All right, never mind. That's usually the case. Yeah, yeah. And almost every time I have anybody ever pushed me to the limit where I'm offended, it seems like bar none when I've ever gone and investigated them. I'm like, oh, this person's a moron. Like, they're crazy. They think that, like, you know, the, the, the inside job. It's like, all right, this guy, you know, it's usually hand in hand with some other crazy conspiracies and, and different shit that they're saying and spouting off. I'm like, all right, oh, this person just, they need mental attention. Jeez. Well, Medical thank, help. <laughs> well, thank you so much, man. So good thank to you. see you.